Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Josh Corsi. I'm from the Houston Methodist Hospital Division of Colon and Rectal Surgery. Um, today I will be presenting a uh, video on uh, a re primary repair we did for a uh, colon perforation from a uh, colonoscopy. There's our disclosures. So the annual rate of colonoscopic perforations from diagnostic colonoscopy um, are estimated between 0.012 and 0.2 percent annually. Um, now obviously there's a, a wide spectrum of uh, disease that occurs from a colonoscopic perforation, everything from uh, mild clinical disease that can be safely observed with broad spectrum antibiotics to fulminate sepsis requiring laparotomy, fecal diversion, colon resection. However, within the last decade or so, uh, minimally invasive procedures have risen to the forefront as a potential means to manage these. Now um, obviously in order to select patients for minimally invasive management, either endoscopically or laparoscopically, you need to have the right patient. The patients that are with severe sepsis, potentially with uh, confounding severe comorbidities or uh, immunosuppressants may not be the best candidates, but in those patients who are diagnosed early, who have minimal signs of sepsis or SIRS, um, who have minimal fecal contamination and laparoscopic exploration, and who have a uh, site of perforation that is amenable to primary repair, meaning that it's not overly inflamed, there's not a lot of necrotic tissue, something that you can bring together, this is a safe and viable means of treating a colonoscopic perforation. I think I was going to talk slower uh, when I made the slides, so... There it goes. Okay, so our patient um, for this presentation is a 65-year-old woman who uh, was seen by an outside gastroenterologist and was arranged for a screening colonoscopy. It was a difficult procedure secondary to a, uh, red a redundant and uh, tortuous sigmoid colon which required uh, a uh, switch to a pediatric endoscope. Uh, during this portion of the procedure, uh, when the endoscopist was going around, he noticed a defect in the lateral wall of the sigmoid colon with some bulging fat uh, consistent with a, a perforation. The procedure was terminated and she was sent to the ER, which is where we picked her up. The patient's medical and surgical history are fairly unremarkable. She had some garden variety medical issues, including rheumatoid arthritis, however, was not on steroids. She had no prior abdominal surgical history and uh, no significant medications outside of NSAID and some uh, allergy medication. She was hemodynamically normal when we examined her, um, had normal temperature, normal white count, normal vitals. Um, on her abdominal exam, she had some tenderness in the right lower quadrant, but no diffuse or localized peritonitis. Now you can see from her CT scan that there's air adjacent to the sigmoid colon dissecting along the serosal border of the sigmoid into the sigmoid mesentery. And then this tracks all the way up the retroperitoneum uh, posterior to the kidneys and all the way up to the right diaphragm. So based on her clinical findings and uh, the relative short interval between the perforation and, uh, the, uh, uh, and our uh, assessing the patient, uh, we took her to the operating, for, operating room for a laparoscopic exploration with the intention of performing a primary repair. We gained access to the abdomen via the right upper quadrant with a five millimeter optical, optical trocar, uh, performed an exploratory laparoscopy. And you can see down in the pelvis uh, that there is some pneumatosis of the, uh, the, serosal, uh, the, uh, the serosal aspect of the sigmoid colon. Uh, the patient was placed in a steep Trendelenburg position and two additional trocars were introduced. Uh, these were five millimeter trocars at the umbilicus in the right lower quadrant. Uh, there were some lateral attachments of the sigmoid colon that needed to be taken down before we could enact a repair. However, you'll see here in a second, you can see the bubbling on the serosal aspect, and it appears that the perforation occurred into a uh, epiploic appendage in the sigmoid. So before our repair, we did notice that there was some turbid fluid within the pelvis. Um, this was not noted on the original CT scan. There was no free air and there was no free fluid that was seen. However, you could see there was some evidence of contamination there. So we take down the lateral aspect of the sigmoid colon, these attachments to the left pelvic sidewall sharply. And once we have a uh, nicely mobile sigmoid colon, uh, we proceed to enact our repair. 
So we identify the site of perforation, which is this ecomotic area on the uh, lateral aspect of the sigmoid colon. We enter the defect sharply, and you can see that there's a cavity underneath where the perforation has occurred. So in order to uh, fully assess this and repair it, we need to um, increase the size of our, uh, of our window here in order to ensure that we're uh, achieving a repair of the entirety of the defect. You can see the sucker going into the, the, uh, the uh, defect in the uh, colon wall. Using a bipolar energy device, we um, enlarge the defect in the uh, pericolonic adipose tissue. You can see our uh, defect there, which um, has fairly minimal inflammatory changes given that this was an early perforation. Um, this is one of the key aspects for a primary repair is you want this tissue that's nice, soft, and pliable. And you can see as we perform our primary repair here, the tissues are pliable. We're getting able to get good full thickness bites under direct visualization to enact a good repair. Uh, we carried out our repair with a uh, running suture. This is a 2.0 barb suture. And um, making sure to take good uh, bites that include the, uh, uh, the uh, mucosa as well as the uh, full thickness of the colon wall. You can see again the defect there that's being nicely opposed. And the key to, to this repair, this sort of repair, if you're going to enact this, is, is visualization. You need to have a, a segment of colon that's well mobilized, that's uh, easily manipulated, and that you can see that you're getting good bites. We did perform a second layer of closure by uh, reapproximating the pericolonic adipose tissue. Uh, this was once again done with a running uh, VLOC suture, barb suture. Now, in order to confirm our repair, we uh, performed a, a flexible endoscopy. And this enabled us to both visualize the defect um, in the sigmoid colon from the mucosal side and ensure that there was no extraneous debris, that there was no evidence of ischemia, and then also allowed us to prepare uh, to uh, perform a, um, uh, a uh, air insufflation test. So we installed the pelvis with uh, warm saline, and you can see this is our repair site there. There's no bubbling occurring from the site. So at this point, the patient was transferred uh, to the surgical floor. She received no additional doses so of antibiotics. Can you, move, can you move along, please? Thank you. Sure. The so the patient was followed up at six weeks. She did well. And um, this is just a further proof that uh, laparoscopic repair of a primary, or primary laparoscopic repair is a, a, a feasible and efficacious option for patients with an early colon perforation from uh, an iatrogenic source. Happy to take any questions. We have one coming in. Just a quick question. What if you can't find it? Sounds like yeah. it's really nice. <laughs> yes. you, know, you guys did a fantastic job, but what if you can't find it? That, uh, that, that is definitely the question. Um, the options are, uh, in, in, in some cases, you may have a retroperitoneal perforation in which you've got air tracking up the mesentery that you can see on the CT scan. Your options at that point are obviously to mobilize the segment of the colon you think may be involved and to see if you can find it. Um, I, being privy to cases like that before, if the patient is, uh, is obviously manifesting sepsis, uh, the options are to just bring up a loop ileostomy and divert the patient and then allow them to recover and bring them back later for a, uh, uh, for, uh, a reversal. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a very nice video. I just wondered why um, instead of, uh, once you saw the perforation, instead of just maybe sharply freshening up the edges, why you actually extended it to quite a large defect that you then had to close? The idea behind this is that um, it, it's sort of like the, you know, the, the, the looking in the surgical textbooks about exposing um, the extent of an esophageal perforation where what's underneath may be more than what you can see from the external portion. And the, the enlargement that we did of the perforation was really just of the pericolonic adipose tissue. So the, the, we actually didn't extend the defect within the colon wall. It was just to expose the, the portion that was, uh, the, the, to see the full extent of the, uh, the colonic perforation and make sure that there was no additional uh, uh, necrotic tissue that needed to be debrided before uh, we, we performed our repair. Now, if that had been the case, then you could certainly sharply debrid that back to healthy tissue um, as long as the tissues around there are not woody, indurated, and will hold a stitch. I think that that's a perfectly viable option. Thank you. Thank you very much.